Hello, and a warm welcome to this series of veterinary reviews designed to help you prepare for the North American Veterinary Licensing Examination. Let's uh, call that NAVLI for short. My name is Paul Gibbs, and I am Professor of Virology at the College of Veterinary Medicine here at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Together with my friend Carlos Risco, I shall be coordinating the course at the college, and I'm very pleased that we are collaborating with Nova Southeastern University in bringing this course to you. You all know Dr. Sergio Vega, and I must say he's been enormously energetic in organizing this course in South Florida. I know he's outlined the course uh, to you, but it might be helpful if I also make a few comments. Well, first, let's talk about some of the subjects that we're going to be covering. The course recognizes that the NAVLI is clinical in nature, and in fact, it also reflects that many of the questions in the NAVLI are focused on companion animals. But obviously, there are questions on food animals and also on other forms of pets, public health, and some degree of uh, questioning in the area of epidemiology, for example. But clearly, while the focus may be uh, on the clinical aspects of NAVLI, we feel that it uh, needs a good foundation of scientific knowledge as you develop forward. With this in mind, the course starts with seven review sessions on the disciplines of infectious disease, parasitology, pathology, immunology, pharmacology, and toxicology. So these are going to run really before the winter holidays, and they will provide a scientific underpinning to the more clinically focused reviews that start in January. We're going to start today with virology, and then on uh, the next session, uh, we'll be dealing with bacteriology. Both of these subjects are obviously in the news currently in Florida, with both the West Nile outbreak and the anthrax cases. But before I start with the virology review today, let me outline to you how you can get maximum benefit from these reviews. Now, all sessions are going to be taught by a faculty member at the college, and they're going to be taped here at the university. As the course progresses, you will see that our faculty is a very international one, and many of us, in fact, have had to study like you when it comes to being board certified here in the USA. We shall be taping the lectures as the course progresses. So you will receive both cutting-edge and up-to-date information in these review sessions. Once taped, each tape will be distributed to you in advance from NOVA for you to preview at home before it is shown to you as a group in one of the theaters at NOVA. Dr. Vega has distributed the schedule for showing the tapes at NOVA to you already. After the tape has been shown at NOVA, the faculty member featured on the tape will be video conferenced live from the college to NOVA so that you can ask him or her questions for about 30 minutes. Again, I strongly encourage you to preview the tape. Use the pause button on the VCR to study slides closely. Now, there's going to be a lot of material presented in these review sessions. Also, when you are previewing the tape, it is a good time to write down a few questions to ask at the live question and answer session. This session will probably be calling the Q&A session. Well, at this point, we clearly need to start the review session, so let me close by saying that I look forward to meeting you all on November the 27th at the welcome reception at NOVA. Let us now start with reviewing the objectives of this review session on virology. We're going to review the characteristics of the viruses and how they cause disease. We're going to learn a little bit about the diagnosis of viral diseases, 
and then the ways in which they are transmitted and perpetuated. And clearly, this leads through to the control of disease through understanding their epidemiology and uh, features relative to control specifically. Now, relative to this course in general, we shall be recommending to you occasionally textbooks that may be of help to you. In the area of veterinary virology, there is a textbook. Uh, it's written by a number of us, uh, and I've had the privilege to be one of the authors, and that is published by Academic Press, and was published in 1999. And you will find that the content of this review session today, in general, is going to follow the outline of the book. At this point, I want to emphasize to you that we are trying to uh, emphasize the importance of clinical features relative to virology, uh, and you will see this as a common thread throughout all the individual lectures. And for that reason, I'm going to show you a short clip now of West Nile encephalitis in the horse, because obviously this is something of interest to all of us, and it is quite possible that some questions may come up when we come to the NAPLI examination. At this point, you can see here that my colleague, Dr. Maureen Long, is examining this horse and seeing its Venice reaction. And you can see that clearly we've got dull sensation here. And this is my colleague, Dr. Michael Porter, and he's testing clearly the sensitivity of the horse's head now to painful stimuli, and you can see flaccid paralysis of the nostrils and of the lips here. And at this point, he's going to be examining the muscle tone of the tongue, and as you can see here, the horse allows the tongue to remain exterior to the mug. Right. So the situation, as it stands at the moment with West Nile, is that we can see that the northern areas of Florida have many confirmed cases. And at this time, we probably have somewhere in the region of 200 confirmed cases of West Nile. But you can see that in other areas of the state at this time, although we have many suspected cases, uh, we do not have confirmation. And I think this draws an important point uh, immediately, and that is whenever we look at the literature, we must be aware that we have to interpret it with care, and certainly when it comes to epidemiology, we have to look for various sources. Well, now let's step back a little bit to the history of virology. The history of virology is really founded with Louise Pasteur. Uh, we can regard... Pasteur is the father, really, of the science of microbiology, virology, and infectious diseases. But interestingly, he started his career with the study of wine, beer, and cheese. So here is a man that clearly would fit in well with the student body here in Gainesville. But he is best known, really, for his work in developing a vaccine for rabies. Uh, and obviously, many of you who are in practice know the importance of rabies, and the developments that we have seen in recent years with new vaccines. Well, what is a virus? A very simple question. The first thing is that it is really submicroscopic, and by that we mean optical microscopes, and it is an obligate intracellular parasite. Size typically is between 20 to 400 nanometers, and they may be rod-shaped, spherical, or in fact, pleomorphic. They have to grow inside cells in comparison with bacteria. Well, the particle itself, the virus particle, is really produced from the assembly of various preformed components. Virus particles, which we often call virions themselves, do not grow or undergo division. And that's an important point. They replicate. They lack 
the genetic information which encodes apparatus necessary for the generation, really, of metabolic energy or for protein synthesis. If we look at the virus structure itself, then, there are certain features which are important and relate, obviously, to the ways in which we diagnose disease and how we develop vaccines. Many viruses, but not all, uh, have an envelope surrounding them. And this envelope has relevance as it allows, in many cases, the virus to gain access to the cell. And as a practical point here, envelope viruses generally are more fragile than those without envelopes. Now, the structure of the nuclear capsid uh, is essentially shown here for an icosahedral virus. And it is formed of capsomeres on the outside. These are protein units. And with inside the capsid is, in fact, the nuclear material. Now, we classify viruses based, in fact, on the nucleic acid, whether it's DNA or RNA, uh, because this provides, effectively, the information that directs the cell synthesis of new virus particles. And as I've already said, the nucleic acid is enclosed in a protein coat. And uh, already, as I've mentioned, the cell is essential for replication of the virus. And clearly, viruses gain entry to cells uh, through using natural cell receptors. And this is also important, and this is a feature that effectively determines which species of animals are susceptible to different viruses. Now, I've already mentioned that viruses may be icosahedral, they can also be pleomorphic, uh, or they can indeed be complex. And what you are seeing here uh, is an electron microscopic photograph of different virus particles. And you can see here that we have pox viruses, we also have uh, papilloma viruses, herpes, and down here uh, we see the phylovirus, which is normally associated with diseases uh, such as Ebola. And we use the shape of viruses uh, as part of uh, the classification system for viruses. But most importantly, we use the viral genome, the DNA or the RNA, to determine classification. And this uh, is an area that is very complicated. But essentially, DNA viruses come as single-stranded viruses or double-stranded. Whereas with RNA, we can have double-stranded, single-stranded, and we can have positive and negative sense. Most importantly, within the RNA viruses, is this group down here. And those represent the retroviruses. As the name suggests, they have a reverse transcriptase. And they are able, in fact, uh, to code for DNA. And the retroviruses, to give you an example, feline immunodeficiency virus is a retrovirus. So now let's have a look at just, let's say, the positive stranded RNA viruses. And you can see here that we have foot and mouth disease, a virus that is exotic to the United States, but certainly is a cause of major problems at the moment in England. We have the feline felici viruses, which many of you may have seen in practice, causing upper respiratory disease in cats. Peronas commonly occur in many different species. And some of you in equine practice might have come across uh, equine arteritis. Additionally, we have the encephalitides, uh, eastern equine encephalitis, and West Nile. So let's just now put a few families relative to replication strategy uh, appropriate to these different viruses. So, foot and mouth disease virus is, for example, classified in the Picorna viridae. Feline Khaleesi viruses are in the Khaleesi viridae, and Corona viridae come, as one might expect, in the Corona viridae. Likewise, the name is very similar when it comes to the arteriviruses, uh, 
But eastern equine encephalitis virus is classified as a toga virus. And interestingly, West Nile is actually in a separate family from eastern. It is within the Flavi variety. And in this particular case, uh, the Flavi comes from flavors, meaning yellow, and that might suggest to you that in fact yellow fever is also a member of this family. Well, the chemical structure of the proteins that are present in the capsid of viruses is actually very important. These proteins are important for viral stability and attachment. There are, however, non-structural proteins, and these essentially relate to the enzymes that are involved in viral replication. Now, this has importance because antibodies generally are formed only against the structural proteins. When antibodies are found against the non-structural proteins, this actually may be a help to us in differentiating animals that have been vaccinated with inactivated vaccines from those that are naturally infected. So, in other words, an animal that has been vaccinated with an inactivated vaccine will not normally have antibody to the non-structural proteins. Well, you and I both know that viruses are often given serotypes. So what does all this really mean? Well, there's a whole slew of different definitions that we need to be aware of. We quite commonly group viruses uh, that are very similar, such as the blue tongue viruses. But then within these viruses, we may in fact recognize that there are serotypes. And a serotype is generally defined as a virus that does not uh, confer protection against another serotype. So in other words, vaccines have to develop, be developed against each different serotype. And you know that this is the situation, for example, with foot and mouth disease, where there are seven different serotypes. And this type of uh, classification is usually based on specific antigens uh, and quite commonly a group-specific antigen. In addition, then, there are specific antigens usually on the surface of the virus that determine the serospecificity of that agent. Now, you've also heard the phrase a strain. Well, a strain of virus is a very well-characterized virus been used perhaps in different uh, laboratories and characterized uh, extensively. Different strains then have different properties such as virulence. Some strains, one commonly says, are hotter than others. In other words, they cause more severe disease. An isolate refers really to a virus that is recovered simply from a specific host or from a particular location. So all these are terms that we commonly meet when we're talking about virology. Well, what are some of the properties, the physical properties of viruses that are important? Well, these properties, first of all, are important relative to disease uh, disinfection and also the ways in which these viruses are transmitted. Clearly, heat sensitivity is one of the most important. Some viruses are much more hardy than others, the pox viruses, for example, and they can uh, resist both heat to a certain extent and also desiccation due to dryness. Some viruses are more sensitive to pH than others. The enteroviruses, which cause infection through the gut, as one might expect, are generally pH resistant, but herpes viruses are fairly pH sensitive. Adenoviruses are fairly resistant also when it comes to pH, and you see a cartoon here of an adenovirus. Viruses also vary in their sensitivity to lipids. In general, envelope viruses are generally much more sensitive because there is a lipid component to the envelope. And as we all know, there are varieties of chemicals that react with amino acids of proteins 
and some of them can also be used to inactivate DNA or RNA. This becomes important when it comes to the development of inactivated vaccines. When it comes to radiation and ultraviolet light, these features are important relative to whether the virus uh, is inactivated, particularly in the case of ultraviolet light, in a hot, sunny environment, then some viruses obviously are inactivated quite rapidly. And this is particularly important when we consider the ways in which viruses can be transmitted in aerosols. And finally, we come to humidity, and there are different viruses here that uh, respond differently. For example, if we take once again foot and mouth disease, which has been studied extensively in the way in which it uh, spreads through aerosols, we find that uh, those viruses that are well adapted to arid areas uh, do not su uh, survive so well in a humid environment. Well, how do viruses cause disease? And what, in fact, is disease? Well, in a virus-infected host, disease is really the result of the cumulative effects of the virus infection at the cellular level. But this isn't the same for each and every viruses, because viruses cause a variety of changes in infected cells. One way in which we can study this is obviously to look at the ways in which viruses, first of all, behave in cell culture. Now on the right hand side here, you can, of the screen, you can see that we have various photographs of heat infections in cattle. And one of these, uh, this one down here and this one here, is actually caused by bovine herpes mammalitis. Now, when we take samples from the cow's teeth by scraping it, uh, perhaps with a scalpel, and putting it into virus transport media, and submitting it to the diagnostic laboratory, when we grow this virus, or attempt to grow this virus in cell culture, we see that we get syncytia uh, forming in the cell monolayer. On the left-hand side here, you can see that we have an uninfected cell monolayer, and here you can see at low magnification, you've got retraction of infected cells from the glass surface. You've got some degree of stranding and syncytia development. If we then go to a higher magnification, as you see here, you can see, in fact, that you get the syncytia. In other words, syncytia are where the cell divisions break down and you get multinucleated cells. And if we look within the uh, nuclei of these cells, we can see intranuclear inclusion bodies. And this is a fairly good marker of the way in which this virus is replicating. In other words, it's replicating in the nucleus. And we can then begin to relate this to the way in which viruses cause disease in the host animal. First of all, we can get acute clinical disease. And this obviously is the type of disease that most of us are fairly familiar with. The dog that comes in with canine distemper, for example. But quite often, disease is actually subclinical. And we must always remember this, that uh, quite often there is an inapparent infection. Uh, if we talk about human medicine, for example, many of us this time of the year might be exposed to uh, the common cold viruses we will not necessarily develop clinical disease, but we will have become infected. But there are some viruses that, in fact, lead towards the induction of cancer. And the papillomaviruses are a form of cancer in this context. And we also can see that we get chronic progressive disease uh, in some infections, and this occurs especially of the central nervous system. Well, after an animal is infected, we must recognize that there are different patterns of virus excretion, and this has relevance clearly to the ways in which the virus is transmitted from animal to animal, and from population to population. So we have to recognize that in the case of acute infections, such as we might get with equine influenza, uh, 
we can occasionally get virus excretion before we see major clinical disease. And in this uh, diagram here, you can see that virus shedding is indicated by the red arrow and clinical signs by the blob. And an animal that has recovered from equine influenza is not likely to continue excreting the virus. On the other hand, there are other types of virus infections, those that cause persistent infections, such as feline rhino rhinotracheitis, which, as you may well know, is a respiratory infection of cats. You can see that such cats may have intermittent episodes of runny noses, uh, and associated with that, in fact, is virus excretion. And you can see that this is diagrammatically represented here uh, in this second cartoon. However, it's important at this point to mention that when we talk about arbovirus infections, very rarely, if at all, do we get virus excretion. The virus is present in the blood, and it is from the blood that the arthropod vector obviously acquires infection. We also have to recognize that there are some diseases where, in fact, you may get chronic disease. And at the same time, you've got uh, virus excretion continuing all along. And lymphocytic choriomeningitis, one of those famous virus infections of rodents, is a classical example of this particular pattern. And then finally, we may see that a disease has a, a long incubation period during which there may be some virus excretion before you get the expression of major clinical disease. Now, let's talk a little bit about numbers here. In acute infections, uh, you may get as much as 7 log to the base 10 tissue culture infective doses, 50% uh, per ml of virus. That's a lot of virus. Uh, just to give you that figure in sort of numeric terms, we're looking at about 10 million infectious doses per ml of virus. And to give you an example of a disease where you can get that uh, extent of virus present, uh, once again we could talk about the slide you saw a little earlier, bovine herpes mammalitis, you may get seven logs of virus present in vesicular material uh, when you take a sample from the cow's teeth. Similarly, the viremia that you see in arbovirus infection can also rise to this level, and in some cases can even be higher than that. Well, how do we apply this knowledge then to the question of diagnostic virology? What we now have is really a wide range of diagnostic tests available in the clinics. Uh, there's one company shown here in the slide. Uh, it happens to be IDEX, a well-known company, and they have been innovative and brought many new products uh, into the clinics. But equally, there are other companies. And just for a practical exercise, uh, let's go back to now West Nile and perhaps talk a little bit about what I will describe as your clinical case. This is uh, Daisy. Uh, she was brought into the clinics in mid-August of 2001 here in North Florida. Two-year-old filly with progressive depression, elevated temperature, and appears blind and is obviously ataxic. And she was presented to the clinic some two days ago. And obviously, for the purpose of the differential diagnosis today, we'll be assuming that uh, Daisy is infected with a virus. But of course, it could be one of several other conditions. So, what approaches have we got available to us for confirming that Daisy is indeed infected with a virus? Well, we have about six principal ways in approaching this. First of all, we can look toward the isolation of a virus. We can try identifying the causal virus in clinical material by electron microscopy. Or we can try and identify viral antigen or viral-induced antigen in clinical material by using serology. We can go further in that we can attempt to identify viral DNA 
or RNA by using molecular probes and also by using a technique which I'm sure you've heard of, the polymerase chain reaction, often known as PCR, an extremely important and powerful tool that we now have at our disposal. But we can go back to the characteristic cellular pathology, a technique that's been available for more than a hundred years to identify virus diseases. And finally, and this is usually more of a retrospective nature, we can look towards the demonstration of an antibody response. In other words, we're looking for a fourfold rise in antibody. Let's talk a little bit about virus detection using virus isolation. And for this purpose, we will assume now that Daisy might have been infected with a herpes virus. In this particular case, we would take clinical material and we would put it on to cultured cells of equine kidney and we would look for a cytopathic effect. And if, in fact, the virus grew in the cells, we would once again see a picture, as we saw earlier for bovine herpes mammalitis, that we would see intranuclear inclusions uh, within the affected cells. But we could also confirm that uh, that it was possibly a herpes virus growing in cell culture by using immunofluorescence. And for this purpose, obviously, we would be using a specific anti-herpes virus antibody. Now, in the case of diagnosis of encephalitis, the electron microscope, in all honesty, is not particularly helpful, at least uh, anti-mortem. But if it were a skin infection, then quite often we could look for the characteristic appearance of different viruses using electron microscopy. Now, that's using electron microscopy to examine clinical material. Obviously, we can also use electron microscopy to characterize the virus by looking at the virus isolates from cell culture. And as you saw this slide previously, you can see that we have quite characteristic morphology of some of the major groups of viruses. So this can provide us with a presumptive diagnosis. But most of you are probably fairly familiar with the approach to diagnosis using serology. And here we are picking up viral antigen. And the most common technique that we use for this approach at this time is the ELISA, which stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. So it's not an ELISA test, it is simply an ELISA. And I'm sure that many of you will be aware that there are kits within most veterinary practices that can be used using this type of technology for leukemia virus. Uh, and this slide here shows witness uh, test for feline leukemia virus. In the case of looking for uh, viral antigen using serology for influenza viruses and arboviruses, traditionally we still find that the hemagglutination test is of great practical use. But let's have a look at, in fact, the ELISA test uh, and how it essentially works. Well, first of all, we have to have a capturing antibody that you can see down here. So this is directed specifically to the virus that is of particular interest to us. So the sample is then uh, added to the well in which there is a capture antibody. And subsequently, as you can see here, there is a second antibody with an enzymic color or an enzyme associated with it that, in fact, attaches then to the captured virus or viral antigen. And then by using uh, various enzymes, sorry, I'm, I'm getting that wrong, by using then uh, the substrate for the enzyme, we then, in fact, can realize the color. And clearly, if there has been no attachment by the detecting antibody, you won't, in fact, be getting a color formation. And this technology has now been sophisticated so that, in fact, we don't simply use wells uh, as we used to, microtiter plates now. We quite often use this immunogration, immunomigration technology, 
And you can see that it can be used for canine parvovirus, as you see in this case here. And this gives you a breakdown of the system that is used for feline leukemia. Uh, the sample in which the feline leukemia antigen is present is allowed to migrate through a filter, and then it is moved towards the second antibody that is present here, and then excess carries on, and then this results, in fact, in reading the results where you have a positive control and you also have a positive reaction. And I'm sure that many of you uh, are in a position that you can get a hold of these tests and you can look at them quite closely and see, in fact, how they work. These tests are exceedingly valuable. I'm now talking about the ELISA test. But for many purposes now, uh, diagnostic purposes, we are also using the polymerase chain reaction. And I think it's appropriate to look back a little bit and realize that uh, this technology is used not only for virology, but it's also used in man many other areas. And it is one of the major techniques that we use now for molecular epidemiology, which I will be talking about a little later. And it's also used in uh, genetic recombination techniques uh, in the production of vaccines, etc. And the person who uh, developed this technique is Carrie Mollis, a um, guy from uh, the West Coast, uh, very much a surfer. And he came up with the concept of the technique, and it's a very complicated technique, which I won't go into detail today for you. Now, using this type of technology developed by Carrie Mallis, what we find is that uh, we can, in fact, then begin to develop phylogenetic trees based on envelope glycoproteins, for example. And uh, what we can see here, and going back now to West Nile, we can actually see that the isolate that came from New York which was where West Nile, as you know, was introduced to North America in 1999, has many similarities, in fact, to a virus that was isolated uh, in 1998 in Israel. How precisely this virus, however, got to the United States remains somewhat of a mystery at this time. But let's come back to DAISY, and let's now look at the other more simple techniques that we can use for identifying uh, a diagnosis. And in this particular case, we can come back and we can look at histopathology. And you can see here that uh, in the gross section, you can see hemorrhage. And then if we look uh, at the same tissues, but uh, the histopathological appearance, you can see that we've got neutrophils here and a degree of hemorrhage. And from that, we can probably say that, in fact, Daisy, in fact, would probably be suffering more from Eastern than from the other viruses. So in that context, before we go on to talking about veterinary vir uh, viral vaccines, we need to recognize, in fact, that we need to come to a diagnosis by putting together many different techniques. And obviously, the veterinary diagnostic lab is going to choose those techniques that are most appropriate to the diseases that are suspected. At this point, uh, I would like now to move on to the next area, and that is that of viral vaccines. Now, the history of vaccination, in fact, is a very long one. It starts, in fact, with Jenna. And Jenna was a clergyman in the western parts of England. And it was Jenna who really developed the vaccine that uh, led to the eradication of smallpox uh, from the world. And that eradication was achieved uh, in 1979. And since that time, we have had global eradication of smallpox. And he used a related virus called cowpox, and obviously that is a very simple live virus vaccine. 
So that constitutes the first type of vaccine that we can use. And it, over the course of time, what we have done is that we have attenuated many of these viruses so that now uh, they do not cause uh, major clinical disease in the vaccinated animal. However, we have non-replicating native antigen vaccines, and obviously these are mostly inactivated. And you are very familiar, I'm sure, with inactivated vaccines and the practices that you've been associated with. We have a new generation of vaccines coming uh, available at this time, and these are vaccines that are produced by recombinant DNA technology. And quite often we may uh, see that these use, in fact, uh, a virus vector into which other unrelated genes are inserted. And then there is a whole family of DNA vaccines which represent the future. At this time, however, there are no DNA vaccines in commercial production. And all of these different types of vaccines and, and the ways in which they are developed is dealt with in much more detail in the textbook that I referred to you earlier on. But what are the applications of today's vaccines? It may surprise you that they are, in fact, in use beyond simply the control of disease. Uh, one particular interesting application is within the area of contraception and sterilization. And in this particular area, we notice that, in fact, the vector systems using perhaps pox viruses or adenoviruses are currently being looked at. But these vaccines clearly have to be very carefully evaluated. And it is true of all vaccines that not only do we have to produce uh, good evidence that they are safe, but clearly we have to uh, recognize that we have to test them for efficacy as well. So those are the different types of vaccines that are perhaps in development. But it is appropriate, in fact, to recognize what's really on the market. With a few exceptions, most vaccines on the market today are either inactivated or attenuated. And a good example of an inactivated vaccine is Eastern Equine Encephalomyelitis vaccine. An example of a very interesting attenuated vaccine is feline infectious peritonitis vaccine. And you can see here uh, that we have a slide showing a vaccine produced by Fort Dodge which is the inactivated product for Eastern Equine Encephalitis. And here is a, a product called Primicel. Some of you may have come across. And this is uh, an approach to vaccinating the cat against feline infectious peritonitis, a very difficult problem to vaccinate against. Well, what are the pros and cons of inactivated vaccines? Well, first of all, Inactivated vaccines have the great advantage that they are stable. And provided, and this is a big provision, that the virus is completely inactivated, there is really no danger of spread from the vaccinated animal. And additionally, uh, we do not see problems with viral interference. In other words, the interference from existing viruses in these animals. When it comes to the cons, the disadvantages, we often find with inactivated vaccines that you're going to require multiple doses uh, before you can get protective immunity. Importantly, we generally do not see good local immunity or interference produced with inactivated vaccines. And because you have to have a much higher concentration of antigen uh, to induce immunity, this often causes them to be somewhat expensive. Unfortunately, the immunity with inactivated vaccines is often very short-lived. And furthermore, uh, as I've already mentioned to you, any non-inactivated virus can indeed cause disease. To overcome some of these problems with inactivated vaccines, we will commonly see that 
they are in fact mixed with adjuvants. And certainly the Fort Dodge product that I was just mentioning to you for Eastern Equine and Cephalomyelitis, it has an adjuvant incorporated into it. An adjuvant is an agent that is essentially used to enhance the immunologic response to inactivated vaccines. That's how we can conveniently define them. And they do this by causing a much slower release and degradation of antigens, and they also can work towards stimulating phagocytosis. One common adjuvant, particularly in use in human medicine, is aluminum hydroxide. Uh, but within veterinary medicine, we have uh, a much wider variety of products that we can also use. And for example, we can use ISCONs, which are immunostimulating uh, concentrations, usually based on uh, cholesterol and other products such as that. When we look at attenuated vaccines, attenuated vaccines are generally better immunogens because the modified live virus replicates in the host, thus producing longer lasting immunity that really is similar to that of a natural infection. In the case of Primazel, uh, the FIP vaccine, then what we are recognizing here is that in fact this is also a modified virus, but in a slightly different way, in that it is uh, a temperature sensitive mutant and only replicates in the nasal uh, passages of the cat. And you can see the vaccine being administered here intranasally. Most successful vaccines uh, that we see around the world are essentially attenuated vaccines. What we are now seeing is that we have a variety of gene-deleted and marker vaccines available on the market. And I'll come back to those in a minute or two. So what are the pros and cons of attenuated vaccines? Well, the advantages. A single dose may be effective. It can be given by a natural route stimulating local and systemic immunity. It produces usually a much longer lived immunity than the inactivated vaccines. And the other feature is that in general they are less expensive and therefore easier to produce in that context. The disadvantages are that it's always possible that you can get reversion to virulence. It's conceivable that you can get spread to contact animals and also the viruses, the vaccine virus can cross the placenta and cause problems with the fetus. It can either lead to abortion or it can in fact lead to persistent infection. And there's also the problem that you may have contaminating viruses or mycoplasmas present uh, in your vaccine. And there have been some very unfortunate examples for example, blue tongue virus getting into canine vaccines or bovine virus diarrhea getting into uh, cattle vaccines uh, that drug companies or pharmaceutical companies have had to deal with. So there are disadvantages of attenuated vaccines. And of course, occasionally, there are vaccines that seem to fail. And why is this? Well, the first thing is that they can simply be used improperly. Uh, they may have been stored inappropriately. They may have been baked in the back of a car when they are attenuated vaccines. And the heat has simply, in fact, uh, caused the viruses to die. Interestingly, we can, in fact, see genetic differences between animals. Uh, you're probably aware that Rottweilers don't always respond uh, as well to parvo vaccines as other breeds of dogs. And clearly, we may be using the wrong antigenic configuration in the vaccine against the disease that we're hoping to control. As I mentioned earlier, we may simply be using a vaccine to the wrong type. Generally, uh, we can find that blocking by maternal antibodies is, however, the major reason why probably vaccines fail. And finally, 
the last example here is that essentially we're administering vaccine following infection. In other words, the animal is infected, we then vaccinate it, and we consider that the animal has gone down with disease because of the failure of vaccination. That is not necessarily the case. Obviously, there is one exception where you use vaccines after an animal has become infected, and that is in the case of rabies. But let's go back and look, therefore, at the reason why many vaccines fail, uh, or at least are perceived to fail, and that is because they are used when the animal itself has maternal antibody. And obviously, we're talking here of young animals. And this uh, diagram explains essentially what happens here. After the animal is born, it acquires passive immunity, which then progressively decays until it gets down to a level, quite commonly, let's say, in the puppy, to around about 12 weeks of age. You are not able to detect uh, any antibody present if you were to take a serum sample. However, uh, the amount of antibody that a puppy may receive uh, varies between animals in a litter. And for that reason, we generally, as you well know, advocate vaccination really between 8 and 10 weeks, because that's probably when most puppies are at a point where they can be successfully vaccinated. So in other words, the window of susceptibility, if one doesn't vaccinate, uh, is seen between 8 and 10 weeks, when obviously these animals could become infected. However, we have to balance that off against what is the minimal level for protection. And when we take these various factors into consideration, we recognize that it's best, in practical terms, to vaccinate an animal, even using live virus vaccines, probably at least twice at intervals of a few weeks from eight weeks onwards. Well, I mentioned earlier on that there are some now quite sophisticated vaccines that are available, uh, which can also be used not only to control disease, but can be used within eradication programs for specific diseases. And these are based on uh, gene deletion. A gene-deleted vaccine is characterized by removing the virulent genes. And in this cartoon here, you can see that the virulence gene is shown as the red segment. So using uh, endonuclease, uh, uh, sorry, endonucleases, we can in fact remove the virulence gene and we can subsequently produce a virus or a vaccine strain then uh, from the original pathogenic virus. And this has been done quite extensively with the herpes viruses. And this, for example, uh, is a technology that has led to the development of new pseudorabies vaccines. Uh, and the gene-deleted vaccines of pseudorabies really have led the way for the development of many other products. It also has the great advantage that we can sometimes remove genes that are coding for proteins that are antigenic. What this translates into is that we can remove, for example, the G1 gene, as we see here in this diagram of the DNA of pseudorabies, and that gene does not seem to be important in the replication of the virus. But the pig normally produces antibody to that particular gene. So by deleting that gene and then using uh, the modified vaccine in the pig, what we can find is that the pig is not going to develop vaccine, sorry, antibody to the deleted marker protein. So what this really means is that we can then use ELISA techniques to see whether the pig has got antibody uh, to field virus or whether it in fact is lacking antibody to that marker gene, in which case it will simply have been vaccinated. Using a very similar approach, we can see now that in Europe, they are working towards the eradication of infectious bovine rhinotracheitis by application of gene-deleted marker vaccines. And I'll just walk you through uh, the various categories 
that we could anticipate an animal might fall into. If it were an infected cow, then the result of the blood test, and in this case we're not using, uh, we're using a, a, a gene called GE that's been deleted. Now obviously, in the case of an infected animal, uh, and it met the normal virulent virus, then it would be positive for the blood test. A non-infected cow obviously would be negative. A vaccinated cow with conventional vaccine without the gene deletion would also be positive. But on the other hand, a marker vaccinated cow uh, would be negative for the GE uh, antibody. On the other hand, if it had been both vaccinated and had become infected, then clearly that animal would be positive. So looking at these various categories, uh, it is possible then to move forward and eradicate disease from even vaccinated herds. Now I've mentioned that there are many exciting developments in terms of recombinant vaccines. This is one that uh, is featured for the development of canine distemper and it's based on a pox virus, uh, in this case it's canary pox. And I won't go through the detail other than simply to say that we start off in this case with canine distemper, we recognize what uh, proteins confer immunity, in other words, what proteins induce antibody, and we take then the gene coding for those proteins and insert them into canary pox virus. This virus, when inoculated into the dog, doesn't actually replicate to produce infectious virus, but the genes themselves are expressed. And as they are expressed, so the protein is produced, which induces the immune response. And this is, as I said, a vaccine that is available for use in dogs to protect them against canine distemper. Now, vaccinia virus, which, as we've already mentioned, was the virus that Jenna used, or developed, actually, uh, to control smallpox has also been used for a vaccine to protect and control rabies in wildlife. Now this is a live virus vaccine and what we have seen is that the gene that codes for the immunogenic protein associated with rabies has been cloned into vaccinia virus. And because of the characteristics of the robustness of vaccinia virus, it's been used widely in the field as an oral vaccine to control disease in foxes in Europe and share in the United States in raccoons. At this point, uh, I'm going to now summarize some of the important areas of advancement in epidemiology, because ultimately control of disease is dependent not only upon vaccines, but also understanding the epidemiology of a virus. Epidemiology is the study of the determinants, dynamics, and distribution of diseases in a population. And nowhere are we seeing this better than in the current foot and mouth disease epidemic that is ravaging or has been recently ravaging the United Kingdom. We're going to talk about this uh, when we get through to the foreign animal diseases lecture, which is much later on in this review course. Now, a few definitions might be appropriate here. The risk of infection and or disease is really determined by the characteristics of the virus, such as, for example, antigenic variation, but also the host, the host population, because it may have innate or acquired resistance, behavioral, environmental, and ecological factors that affect virus transmission from one animal to another. So we can almost define epidemiology loosely as the science attempting to meld these factors essentially into a unified whole. In other words, we have to look at it as really a branch of population biology. I'm not going to go through all the different terms of endemic, epidemic, pandemic, etc. Other than to say to you that these 
term stem from demos, uh, meaning really the population, uh, and as such they can be applied in veterinary medicine. medicine. So we don't really have to deal with uh, those complex epizootics, epionetics, etc. We can use the simple words endemic, epidemic, pandemic. Clearly, in preparing for the NAVLI exam, you really need to know about incidence, prevalence, case control, cohorts, and the concepts of mathematical modeling, molecular epidemiology, uh, and you also clearly need to know about those terms such as sensitivity and specificity when it comes to the uh, use of diagnostic techniques. But epidemiology is really, as we've already mentioned, uh, very much focused on transmission. And we need to know the different routes of transmission of the different viruses. And for convenience here, I have picked on two cartoons looking at infection in man and the various organs that are associated with virus excretion. Now, I don't want you to really look at these in great detail other than to simply recognize that different viruses are excreted using different routes. And if you wish, you can find the equivalent diagrams uh, in veterinary virology. It's also important, I suppose, to mention to you at this time that we must also recognize that a lot of our knowledge in virology comes from similar studies in humans, and likewise human virology often benefits from studying what in fact occurs in animals. Uh, a lot of the early work on AIDS was benefited by considerable knowledge of how these lentiviruses actually replicate in animals. Now, there is a simplistic way of analyzing really the mechanisms of transmission and we can also look at this as ways in which really viruses are perpetuated from one generation to another. And I'm going to briefly explain to you what short cycle infection is, persistent infection, resistance of the virus to the environment, involvement of an intermediate host, and also then congenital and vertical transmission. And with knowledge of this framework we then can relate it basically to transmission and from which we can build up an assessment of risk and from that a development of control policies. This clearly leads to action in veterinary practice but also government involvement at local, national and international levels. So in other words we can extrapolate in many different ways from what happens in the clinical practice to the veterinary practice to, in fact, national and international levels. Well, the first type of mechanism that we should look at is the short cycle infection. And this is what we sometimes call acute self-limiting. This is associated with viruses that have a very high efficiency of transmission. Virus excretion is of short duration to limit the reduction of susceptibles. And immunity forces variants, and this leads in some cases to antigenic shift and drift. And the classic virus that conforms to this type of mechanism is, of course, influenza. And here on the right you see some of the steps that were put in place to control influenza as it was seen in poultry at the time in Hong Kong because it was recognized that because of the antigenic shift that was occurring that this virus could cause disease in people. And influenza viruses can exhibit shift because they essentially have this opportunity to gene swap. And once again, this is something you should be aware of. It's a very complex area. Uh, and you will find information of this in various virology textbooks. But what you do need to know is that quite often poultry, uh, pigs and people form a very complex mix by which reassortants can develop and as such they can then evade the immune response that is acquired from previous epidemics. <laughs> 
The second mechanism that you need to be aware of is really that of persistence and latent infection. Now, we recognize that there may be prolonged periods of excretion, thereby reducing the population necessary for transmission. This type of mechanism promotes transmission from non-herding species by the venereal route. And it is a feature, quite often, of these viruses that antibody and virus can coexist, which obviously, in turn, also promotes antigenic variation. And one of the classic diseases that we are aware of here is uh, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, a herpes infection. But we could also be talking about feline viral rhinotracheitis in a country. The next mechanism that we need to be aware of is the fact that viruses can be very resistant to the environment. In this particular case, survival basically is favoring fomite transmission or transmission in meat products. The virus is really quite often not highly infectious, hence the number of susceptible animals does not fall as animals born compensate for those that are infected. Let me give you an example. Uh, equine warts, as you see in the right-hand picture here. What we are seeing here is, in fact, an animal that quite easily could have acquired this infection from an infected bit or something of that nature. And in many cases, viruses are transmitted from one continent to another through the vehicle of infected meat. An African swine fever, an exotic virus here to the United States, is a good example of a virus that can be transmitted in meat products. Yet another mechanism is perpetuation through the intermediate host. Now, the intermediate host is often an arthropod in which virus replicates. And that introduces the definition of biological transmission. Biological transmission is used to describe, in fact, the route of transmission which involves an arthropod in which the virus itself replicates, as opposed to mechanical transmission, which simply refers to the transfer of virus, say, on the mouth parts of a biting insect, as opposed to replication. And obviously, when the virus replicates in an arthropod, then it is transmitted through the salivary glands. Now, arthropod-borne diseases are very complicated, and this is quite commonly because there are many different animal hosts, and there can be several arthropod vectors. And that brings us back once again to West Nile encephalitis. What we're seeing with West Nile is that the virus cycle essentially features birds, and in this case, it is in large part a silent cycle. In other words, there is no clinical disease seen in the majority of the birds. There is an exception to that in the case of West Nile, and that is the crow, and the crow seems to develop a highly lethal infection, and we use that as an indicator host. Clearly, the levels of virus in the birds, in terms of levels of virus in the blood, in the viremic stage, can be very high, so that different species of mosquitoes can, in fact, become vectors. When the virus uh, is introduced to humans, or to the horse, or to other mammals, then in many cases, there is no virus replication to the extent that there is a viremia that can infect further mosquitoes. And in this context, we consider these hosts as dead-end hosts. It doesn't mean to say they don't develop clinical disease. It simply means that in terms of the perpetuation of the virus, then uh, the virus has reached a dead end. Finally, there is the fifth mechanism by which viruses perpetuate themselves, and that is through congenital or vertical transmission. 
Now, the virus may be transmitted transplacentally without necessarily causing either death or fetal abnormalities. Indeed, if the virus crosses the placenta and infects the, the fetus before the immune response has developed, it may in fact be recognized as self. In other words, immune tolerance has been induced. And within this context, bovine virus diarrhea is one of the classic examples. In this photograph here on the right, you can see actually a number of steers, uh, four of which are normal size and one very small. Yet all of these are in fact infected with DVD. It is simply that the virus infected them at different stages in terms of the immune response. And this diagram shows you the complexity of bovine virus diarrhea in terms of the way in which this virus is perpetuated and the ways in which it can cause clinical disease, significant clinical disease, uh, quite often in a dairy herd. Finally, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about epidemiological modeling. And once again, the current epidemic of foot and mouth disease in the United Kingdom is showing us the value of this type of modeling. And once again, it relates to transmission. You can see uh, here that the virus spread very rapidly in the first few weeks in Britain so that many farms were affected throughout England, extending into Scotland and also into Wales. And on the right here, you see from the index case, which occurred up here in Northumberland, you can then see epidemiological linkage of what outbreaks appeared to be related to what movements. But the ability of a virus to spread, such as we saw there, from farm to farm, in other words, from animal to animal, it's based on the basic reproduction number that we see uh, associated with a virus. So what does R0 really mean, or RO? It's defined as the number of secondary cases arising from a single primary case. And obviously, this represents the critical threshold. If the basic reproduction rate is obviously less than 1, then infection will die out. And using this basic concept and then applying movement controls, slaughter policies, etc., the scientists in Britain came up with a model that helped them in terms of their policy as to, in fact, what they should do relative to slaughter, whether they should slaughter out contiguous herds or only infected herds. And they opted, looking at the various model results that they obtained, and you can see these here on the left, and I won't go into these in any great detail, but you can see that when they had a policy that was based on slaughtering out not only infected farms, but also neighboring farms, as you can see here in the yellow, then they predicted that that would be the route to follow. Uh, and here you see in green the actual uh, statistics relative to the daily case incidence. And you can see here that adopting this policy, they were able to control the epidemic. But where, for example, did this virus come from? And this is a good example of molecular epidemiology. I showed you a little bit of this information before when we talked about West Nile. But once again, this can be used to determine perhaps where a virus isolate originated from. And in this particular case, we can see by looking at the relationship of many, many different viruses from around the world, that the UK isolates had great similarity, in fact, uh, to isolates from South Africa and also to other parts of Asia. And all this information is then fed into disease control and information agencies. And here in the United States, clearly we are dealing uh, with both federal and state offices that are 
associated with disease control policies. And if we look at, for example, the state of Florida, and I've given you the web addresses here, if you go into this website, you will, for example, find uh, current knowledge on the status of West Nile uh, throughout Florida. Well, this has been a, a very intensive short course in virology. Uh, I'm sure that you will probably want to review this tape once or twice. But I hope that it has provided you with some of the basic understanding of viruses and the diseases they cause so that you can interpret the more clinical review sessions that will be coming up uh, starting in January. Thank you very much.